low country. It is land and water, forest, islands, and salt marshes, a place of contrasts and of a timeless harmony built upon over thousands of years. North of historic Charleston, the Francis Marion National Forest and the Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge protect, restore, and maintain important ecosystems. Here, history mingles with the present. State-of-the-art management techniques ensure that forests and marshlands and endangered plants and animals will continue on. Thriving natural systems coexist side by side with the bustle of human activity. The forest lands and wildlife refuge are linked in management as they are in nature, a place of unique cooperation. The Seawee Visitor and Environmental Education Center is a joint effort of two agencies, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Forest Service and the U.S. Department of Interior's Fish and Wildlife Service. It provides an introduction and interpretation of both forest and refuge. Since prehistoric times, going back more than 10,000 years, people have helped shape this environment. At the time of European contact, the Siwi Indians used fire to open up the forest for farming and to drive game for hunting. The arrival of European settlers in the late 1600s introduced an era of sometimes rapid and often dramatic change. Plantations cut into the forest. Wetlands were drained and cultivated. But it was in the swamps and thick woods of the area that American General Francis Marion sought refuge during the Revolutionary War. Hiding with his men and striking out at the British, they then melded into the forests and blackwater swamps. Elusive and uncatchable, through time and legend, he gained the name Swamp Fox. Francis Marion National Forest includes lands that the Swamp Fox once roamed. Later, his exploits inspired novels and motion pictures. By the mid-1700s, the plantation economy was thriving. Much of the forest land was cut for naval stores, tar, pitch, and turpentine for sailing ships. Hardwood swamps were dissected with drainage canals, embankments, and planted with rice. Following the Civil War, the plantation system collapsed, and many of the fields returned to the wild. In the early 1900s, intensive logging, accompanied by severe and uncontrolled wildfires, left a bleak, desolate landscape. In 1936, President Franklin Roosevelt set aside the Francis Marion National Forest with the intent to revive an abused land by restoring it to a healthy forest in cooperation with the Civilian Conservation Corps. The Francis Marion National Forest encompasses more than 250,000 acres. Much of the area is covered by upland forest. This forest type is comprised of loblolly and longleaf pines, oaks, hickories, with an understory which includes Virginia chain fern and flowering dogwood. Penetrating the upland forest are blackwater creeks and swamps, cloaked by bottomland hardwood forest, including bald cypress. Unique to the coastal plains of the Carolinas and Georgia are small oval wetland depressions. There are over two dozen Carolina bays in the forest. Some shelter an array of wetland plants, including the carnivorous pitcher plant. Where the forest meets the saltwater marsh, humans have long been a part of the coastal environment. Seawee Shell Ring was a settlement over 4,000 years ago. A giant mounded circle of oyster shells, 
prehistoric fishing and hunting people built the mound over several centuries. It was probably not a permanent home, but a seasonal camp or a ceremonial destination. No matter what, Seawee Shell Ring was important enough to draw people here over a period of centuries. The story is told in oyster shells that rise to over 10 feet above the neighboring marshland. Canoes provided access to fishing grounds and oyster beds. Today, fishing is still a part of the local economy. To the east, covering 66,000 acres along a 22-mile stretch of coast, the Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge was set aside to provide wintering habitat for migratory birds. Created in 1932, the refuge comprises a maze of islands, waterways, and bays. The Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge protects a complex ecosystem. Much of the refuge is a marsh estuary. Fresh water, draining from the uplands, mixes with the salty water of the sea. This is one of many ways in which the refuge and the forest are linked. The salt marsh environment is rich in life. Like a living organism, its pulse is the ebb and flow of tides. Its arteries, the myriad of channels and sloughs that feed the marsh. Many of the marsh areas are covered in vast fields of spartina, otherwise known as cordgrass. The marsh environment is home and nesting ground for several species of shorebirds, and a stopover for migrating birds on the Atlantic Flyway. Invertebrates such as shellfish and crustaceans are part of the foundation of life of a saltwater marsh. Some barrier islands support maritime forests. These trees are tolerant of trying maritime conditions, yet the forests and the barrier islands are susceptible to shifting sands, changing currents, and the erosive power of storms. On Bull Island, the boneyard is a ghost forest and tells of the retreat of land and the onslaught of beach erosion. But the beach is also a vital nesting ground for shorebirds. In recent years, the numbers of once plentiful oyster catchers have declined dramatically. Now, island nesting sites are set aside to help in their recovery. The refuge also receives nearly one-third of the East Coast population of oyster catchers during the winter. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service manages ponds to provide needed habitat for waterfowl and shorebirds. Biologists actively work to provide secure nesting grounds for the threatened loggerhead sea turtle. The goal is to reverse the steady decline of the numbers of loggerhead sea turtles through loss of habitat and predation. In early summer, female loggerhead sea turtles come ashore to lay their eggs. 55 days later, the hatchlings emerge and race for the surf line guided by the light of the moon and stars. In the wild, it is literally a race for life, with the beach stalked by ghost crabs, raccoons, and a host of other natural predators. Now, with the help of volunteers and wildlife biologists, most hatchlings reach the sea, where they face an entirely different set of predators and challenges leaving the turtle with only one in 1,000 chance of reaching adulthood. The fate of the loggerhead sea turtle is a barometer of the health of the ocean and its shores. Can an age-old species survive intensive human use of beaches? The efforts at Cape Romaine and other refuges may be the last best hope for the loggerhead sea turtle.
Today, both the forest and refuge are sites of ongoing management efforts designed to restore the natural environment and to protect species. For as long as there have been humans here, fire has been used to shape and maintain the forest. With its very thick bark and a heavily protected bud, longleaf pine is particularly adapted to fire and requires regular burning to release the seedling out of its formative, grass-like stage. Once ranging over 90 million acres in what is now the southeastern U.S., the longleaf pine forest was severely reduced after European settlement. Today, it covers only 3% of its original range, or just over 2 million acres. In order to rejuvenate this ancient ecosystem, the Forest Service echoes the past using prescribed burning. Fires set by trained professionals under specific weather conditions restore the forest's health. Controlled fires limit competing vegetation and lessen the possibility of devastating uncontrolled fires. Fires create more open habitat for birds, wildflowers, and native grasses. One bird is directly linked to the health of the longleaf pine forest, the endangered red cockaded woodpecker. It is the only American woodpecker which nests and roosts in live trees. An open understory allows the red cockaded woodpecker to search out insects and see predators such as snakes. Prescribed fire creates this open understory. Once common, this territorial non-migrating bird suffered a vast reduction in numbers in recent decades due to habitat loss. Depleted to just a fraction of its original numbers in the southeast, in 1970, the red cockaded woodpecker was placed on the endangered species list. Now, an intensive prescribed burning program helps maintain habitat necessary for the survival of this unique bird. Success is not assured, but the return of the red cockaded woodpecker will herald a new chapter in our understanding of the natural world. The forest and the refuge remain places for people as well. Hiking, biking, fishing, camping, boating, hunting, and just getting away from it all draw people to this special part of the Low Country. The Siwi Visitor and Environmental Education Center. The forest and the coastal tidelands are a giant science laboratory where we strive to understand the nature of the world at our very doorstep. But this is a laboratory where people are welcome to explore, investigate, and embrace the complex nature of the world. As with the Siwi Indians and those who have come before, people are a part of this place.